Modern fashion is in a crazy state. Consumers are less educated on quality, which has allowed luxury brands to sell subpar products for inflated prices. In 2018, Balenciaga moved the production of the Triple S from Italy to China. Representatives of the brand said that China had the capacity to produce lighter shoes as the reason why they moved production to China. This was a horrible line of reasoning that was essentially an admission of using cheaper materials despite since then increasing the price of the triple s sneakers customers who own pairs that were produced in italy and in china have stated that the italy produced pairs are of a way higher quality than the china ones yet in a wider sense no one questions these decisions made by luxury brands and consumers continue to mindlessly consume their products in this four-part interview series i speak to fashion designers to unpack this issue and to get to the bottom of what good quality actually means in fashion. In this episode, I went to a fashion studio in Deptford, London to speak to a fashion designer named Richie. He produces all of his clothing by hand and creates bespoke garments for his clients. His constant crafting of clothes means that he has a lot of experience working with many different fabrics. In our discussion, he spoke about his work and the difficulty in trying to determine what good quality clothing is because different fabrics have specific uses due to their properties. Yeah, so my name is Richie. Um, I am, I guess, a hybrid of fashion designer, maker, I guess, tailor and stylist in this weird combo together. They're all couture pieces. They're all one of one pieces. That's just what I make currently. I'd also do collections, but just sort of haven't in a while. But yeah, basically all the pieces are kind of, I guess, they sit in a realm of... Um, I, I, I like to try and think of them as like this place between like high-end... Uh, and and I guess the digestible concept of high end, like things like, you know, diffusion lines, like f like essentials or whatever. Um, that kind of, kind of between the two, where it's like people who are wanting to be in more of that, wearing more avant garde stuff, but then un like bringing it to a space that makes sense to your average person instead of it being like, whoa, look at this crazy McQueen thing on a runway that makes no sense to me. How could I ever wear that down the street? Like. Something that bridges that gap kind of together. Um, yeah. Okay, so how long have you been designing and how did you get into fashion design? I have been designing for, I guess, probably maybe six years, I guess. Um, I got into it from my mum. My mum taught me how to sew and pattern make and then I just kind of kept doing it in my living room for like a year and a half, two years and then worked at a few stores in Brisbane, uh, in Australia, um, that were kind of similar to this space. Um, and they were kind of, it was run by this woman who was, did a lot of stuff for the fashion schools in Brisbane, and I was just like, I'll work for free if you just teach me everything you know so I don't have to um, slave away at university. <laughs> I don't know if that's okay to say for no, a university not. project. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, and then so I just kind of did that with her for like, I guess, a year and a half, two years and then moved here because I was sort of born in the UK, but then um, also felt like there was more to more avenues to maybe pursue in fashion um, once you kind of bust out of the Australian island in the middle of nowhere situation. But yeah. So why do you wear masks? Uh, I much prefer for anything to do with the clothes that I make to be about the clothes that I make and not about me necessarily. Um, I feel like people who view these pieces or view, because I, 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 I view my pieces as like, I don't know, it sounds super arrogant and wanky, but like I view them as, as pieces of art because it's like a painting that, you know, if there was one on one piece, it's the same as a painting. Like, you know, maybe an artist will do a print run of all those things, but that actual painting itself exists in one canvas. Um, and so I feel like that stuff should speak for itself rather than me speaking for it as this ambassador of like, this is my, this is me and my name is all about this. And then afterwards you can look at what my, what I birth or whatever. It's like, it's more so like these pieces are the most important thing. And then like, 
I'm very much not the most important thing. I'm very much the background uh, to to what what they are. I, sp I spend all the time making sure that they're the focal point, arguably. Um, so I feel like what I do and where I've come from doesn't mean shit <laughs> compared to like what these pieces are. When people come in here, I much prefer they spend time looking at them than asking me questions. Like, there can be such a debate about like, there's that like, industry standard of it must be an industrial sewing machine or it must be this but I feel like it's like it's not it's not always about necessarily just the machine again like if we're talking about what like a quality stitch is a quality stitch is like what is applicable well I guess again this is my own perception but a quality stitch is like what's applicable to that scenario so for example like you know we could be needing a stitch that that needs to be super wide so that the the like it could be a heavily elastic so for example i had a piece that i've made a little while ago it was a heavily elasticated like very stretchable fabric and obviously i was needing i wanted to, i wanted to stitch a cuff on it that was like very much smaller than the opening of the of the sleeve and so i needed a a, a way thicker sorry a way wider sort of stitch like longer stitch because basically that that what would what would have been stretched would become this big again and so obviously like what would be stretched in a stitch will become just as tight as a regular stitch later on, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but yeah, I think it's like, it all depends on what, um, what you're needing at any given time. Like, I think like, um, there's this assumption that like, there's a, there's an industry standard of like what the stitch should be or whatever. But again, it's very much adaptable to each situation. I think when you start thinking in realms of like, Okay, so like the industry standard of, of making a shirt is it must be stitched with, with this width, width on a stitch and then afterwards has to be overlocked and has to be overlocked with these settings and that sort of stuff. I think like <clears throat> with this sort of like time that we live in where there's all these people who do modding stuff and, uh, or, or also just like general bedroom designers and makers, like the concept of like what even is a, a good uh, I guess like overlock stitch for example has completely changed I think like I see more designs now that I like that when I see them and I look if they've been, have been overlocked because I'm not necessarily someone who overlocks much of my stuff because I kind of like how it naturally curls around the stitch like a lot of again because it's jersey a lot of the time it'll when it washes it'll curl around the stitch <coughs> like a lot of the time I look at pieces that might be overlocked and instead of it being overlocked a lot of the time people will just be using zigzag stitches to overlock these days I feel like it's like the new the new every man's uh, overlocker because everyone can have it instead of like having to buy an overlocking machine and that sort of stuff like I think the second the box starts being like this is what a, a accurately good stitch is then like that's when we start limiting like every avenue of what comes out of it kind of thing and I think like but I guess you know to tell you my average st <laughs> stitch I I don't know it's like I'm usually using a straight stitch a lot of the time obviously but like that's why I also like using a more domestic machine because like as much as this there's a shop space it's like also it's not a studio so I can't just have like an industrial sewing machine for this stitch and this stitch and this stitch and this stitch like this I can carry around that has like all the stitches as much as like it doesn't have the punch power and the speed and the time and all that sort of stuff kind of works with my design language I guess it's one of those things where it's I guess it's like if you like the limitations that you have on your own design stuff start influencing the designs that you make if that makes sense you know how it's like like oh i can i only contextually know how to make a coat from this and then so it affects how you start conceptually thinking about that design in your brain kind of thing i feel like i have that with that machine as well it's like understanding what stitches it's capable of and what stitches are worthwhile for me which is what quality stitches to me I don't know <laughs> that'll be as, as much of an interesting story as you want but um, this piece is uh, actually heavily inspired by I don't know if you've seen the music video for um, the Stone Roses I Want to Be Adored but in the video basically Ian Brown wears a shirt that had uh, probably screen printed on it it was like a bunch of 20 pound notes that were on fire around his neck and I 
thought that that looked incredible. <laughs> and so I thought uh, that would be really interesting, like contextually, if like the elements were taken away from it and but like kept considerably the same. And so all of these are like the exact size of a 20 pound note. Um, and roughly in a similar shape about how they would sort of sit, but again, I guess kind of thought in a more abstract concept about it because I felt like it as an idea was interesting. Kind of kept this as well. This was like just part of like when I bought the roll of this fabric, it was really nice jersey, like really heavy, thick jersey quality. <laughs> and um, and but in right sort of in the midst of it, there was like two sections that they they had had stitched together just to keep the roll like on. And I just thought actually it looked really interesting. It's like it's like overlocked on the other side, obviously with like all of to keep the yeah again to keep the roll together. But um, I just thought design wise actually it looked really good. So I kind of kept it as like this sort of Frankenstein <laughs> thing together. But again, it kind of I guess it that probably popped into my mind again back because of like the idea of minimum wastage conceptually about what I use and what I like throw away from the fabrics, I guess. But yeah, this one, I guess, a little chest rig situation, a bit similar to this one, but I kind of felt like this would be like hot summer festival vibes. <laughs> I think I, uh, the designs that I do are definitely like affected by weather very much so. A big, big influence like early on. Does that affect the fabric to use also? Absolutely, because I, like a big influence early on was like Vex Generation because of how much they designed for the environment of like London in the early 90s, like the whole concept of like, that was when everything was coming out about it being the most watched city in the world and all that sort of stuff. And like, why they're making so much like anonymous pieces and stuff like that. And I think also growing up in Brisbane, it's like very hot there, it's like tropical hot. So you kind of have to <laughs> be smart about the fabrics you use because like, obviously a lot of, also the assumption always comes up of like oh it's not quality if it's not like thick and heavy right but like that's not true obviously you can find that beautiful middle ground of like this works for that correct weather but it's and it's also a quality piece of material at the same time and so yeah I think like that's why I ended up with this because I felt like it was like like also juxtaposing the concept of what fabric you would usually assume um, a jumper to be but then for it to be this sort of like very airy, breathable kind of like festival attire or like day party attire, I was kind of thinking. Because I just, when I bought this fabric, I kept thinking, I couldn't stop thinking about that, uh, that RAF jumper, the one that everyone has, that like, the really oversized one. And I was like, every time I thought about a design with this white fabric, I just thought about a shape like that. And I was like, no, <laughs> you need to like get that out of your mind. And I think this was me running as far as possible away from that design, I think. And just trying to like keep it as like, keep the concepts of like how that jumper was with its kind of like very all over the shop kind of like you know rough sloppy kind of feel to it but then making it a bit more like intentional with its like height and how it kind of would sit and stuff like that I guess. Like I get I get a lot of like different um very different like uh backgrounds of people who come in like I get, I get um I think a lot of my pieces kind of connect also uh in a in the queer space as well very much so because I think I like was heavily influenced by that uh, like community in Brisbane as well and I think like maybe that probably permeates into my designs I would say as well but that's it's just a observation I would say <laughs> but yeah um, yeah Perfect. do you mean to show any I feel like in general from a vague look of the pieces I feel like you can kind of get a understanding that it's like got a reasonably um, I guess Japanese origin of of pattern cutting, arguably just because when I was starting to make pieces, I went to Japan just to sort of explore conceptually like what fashion was outside of a space that I knew, which was Australia. And so, like, I think that heavily influenced probably the cuts of pieces that I ended up making and stuff like that. Because um, I kind of yeah bought a, a few kimonos over there and then kind of deep deconstructed them to try and sort of understand how they minimize wastage and how they cut patterns to make certain shapes when you're wearing the kimonos and stuff like that. Which you can kind of arguably see with like these, you know, my patterns and stuff. Like for example, this is like a general pe pattern for the shirts that I make. They're very like square, very, 
there's not there's not quite as much like curvature that you would assume just because it's like minimizes waste minimizes wastage and also like makes a certain shape with the armpit foldings boring information but <laughs> does that also inspire the reason why you mainly design using black and white yes definitely <laughs> sorry for to say that. i feel like it's like a, a screaming thing in the room but i'm not talking about it yeah it's only black and white arguably because i feel like i want to focus more on the pattern cutting and the fabrics used rather than what color is best for this time or what color is best for this season or whatever because we all have like a black or white piece in our cupboard like it's literally from anyone who gives a shit about fashion to someone who couldn't care less about fashion again we all as a, as it's like always said like we all participate in the morning with fashion or whatever but the reality is we all participate with black or white like at least once a week arguably everyone's got it in their wardrobe so i feel like it's again part of that conceptual idea of like bridging that gap it's like something that is very easily digestible instead of it's like oh look at this avant-garde piece with just like in aqua blue that's like impossible for me to conceptualize in my wardrobe whereas it's like okay i can kind of see that sitting with this piece and this piece kind of thing um again bringing in that idea of like thinking more about it rather than it just being like this intangible concept of having these pieces and these cuts and all this sort of stuff but yeah i think that it, that that is another reason why with the black and white and then also another reason is again because of that time in japan definitely made me think a lot about like their concept that they have of like forever pieces which kind of work in a way of like an item that you purchase that is high end or even medium end like it's it stays in your wardrobe forever until it you know falls apart because it doesn't go out of season it conceptually just like stays in season the whole time that's also what i guess influences the cuts and designs that i make i try to think about styles and and uh, i guess designs that have like lasted in conceptual time. Like I guess like for example like this coat, like I kind of made this coat is in like a combination cut sense of like a kimono cross like I'd seen so many like uh Sunday African vest kind of pieces that walk around this high street all the time and I think they like heavily influence making this piece particularly. Um and then yeah, when I, I kind of looking at things that clearly have lasted the test of time of what cuts work but then also understanding like what can be pushed with it so like what can be changed with it or what can make it I guess different to what it would have been otherwise I mean for example with this one it's more so trying to show like I'm trying to emphasize here the look of what each pattern piece actually looks like when I'm cutting it on the table over there like it's more so to try and emphasize like these are the shapes that they start from and they still exist as these shapes on the coat kind of thing if that if that makes any sense i don't know <laughs> yeah, it makes a lot of sense.